happy, happy Lord's Day. Isn't it wonderful to be with Jesus? Oh, and what awesome worship. I tell you what, I was back there and I'm ready to jump up out of my wheelchair and I'm ready to dance. <laughs> Hallelujah. I couldn't get my arms much higher than this because I'm a quadriplegic. All but one day. Those hands are going to go straight up in the air. Praise you, God. Yes, yes, yes. Ooh. And I love the singing. Pastor Carter, thank you so much for helping to lead that wonderful worship. I love singing, I tell you what, but you know what? I sing because I have to. You saw that video. You saw the dive that I took into shallow water so many years ago. 50 years ago, exactly. And when I broke my neck, and they told me I'd never walk again, never have use of my hands, I plummeted into depression. But I think back on those dark days and the hospital when I wanted so badly to cry, but there was nobody around to wipe my nose or my eyes, and it's bad enough being a quadriplegic without being a messy quadriplegic. <laughs> so instead, I would sing. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by. Oh, Jesus, please, don't pass me by. That song reflected a very favorite scripture that when visiting hours would start and friends would come into the hospital with their Bibles, and they would ask me, what do, you, what do you want to hear from God's word? I would think of that song, Savior, Don't Pass Me By. And I would ask them to please read from John chapter 5. Let me read it for you now because I think you'll understand why. Because there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in that condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Then Jesus said to him, get up and walk. I would imagine myself there every single night in the hospital. I would picture myself lying beside the man paralyzed on the straw mat, hoping Jesus would touch me, heal me, rescue me, Jesus. I don't want to live the rest of my life without using my hands or my legs. Please, Jesus. But as often as I prayed, I never got out of that wheelchair. When I got out of the hospital, I went to live with my sister, Jay, on the Maryland farm. I broke my neck in the Chesapeake Bay not far from where I lived and one time Jay was getting me up in the morning and it's the usual routine of leg exercises, stretching my arms, doing, doing my toileting routines, giving me a bed bath, strapping on my corset, pulling up my jeans, putting on my blouse, slinging me into my wheelchair, pushing me to the bathroom. And I was getting so tired of this routine. She flicked on a little bedside TV and there happened to be a commercial for a healing service that was going on in Washington, D.C. Catherine Kuhlman was coming to town. Who here remembers Catherine Kuhlman? Yeah, she was, you know, the faith healer of her day, and I was so excited. So Jay and I got in the station wagon. We drove down the next week to the Hilton Ballroom in Washington, D.C., where Ms. Kuhlman was holding her crusade. It was so exciting. We wheeled into this grand ballroom. Thousands of people were there. And they took me to the wheelchair section and the organ music began playing and testimonies were offered and scriptures were read and all of a sudden Ms. Coleman waltzed onto the stage in her flowing white gown and I was so pumped, I was so thrilled. Tonight was gonna be my night to get healed. Well, after more testimonies were given and scriptures read, the spotlight moved to the corner of the back of the ballroom. It appeared as though there were some healings going on back there. And I got real excited. And then after more applause and other scriptures, then the spotlight shifted to the middle of the back of the ballroom. Healings were going on there too. And then the spotlight shifted again. More healings, it seemed. And I'm thinking, 
Holy Spirit, come over here to the wheelchair section where all the hard cases are. Come over here. But the spotlight never made it to the wheelchair section. And I remember that the ushers came early to usher all of us in the wheelchair section out early so as to not create a traffic jam at the Delta elevator. And I was sitting there, number 15, in a long line of 35 disabled people, either on crutches or wheelchairs, with white canes. And we could still hear the organ music and the testimonies and the singing. And I'm looking up and down this long line at the elevator, thinking to myself, something's wrong with this picture. What kind of savior, what kind of healer, what kind of deliverer would refuse the prayers of people with disabilities, people like me, people who use wheelchairs? Okay, I thought resolutely, if God's not going to heal me, then I'm just not going to do this. I'm not going to live this way. And soon a bitter root, a real spirit of complaining, began to grip hold of my heart. Nothing that anybody did for me was good enough. Every hurdle I faced became a reason to feel sorry for myself. And worst of all, Jesus seemed so far and distant. And if I couldn't be healed, I told my sister, don't get me up in the morning, just leave me in bed, close the drapes, turn out the light, and, and, and just don't come back, don't, just leave me here today. I laid in bed for two long weeks in that darkness, depressed, despairing, and finally, I, 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 just, I just realized I, I, can't, I can't live this way. And, and an old hymn came up from my background that I would sing to comfort myself. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. When darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh abide with me. And finally I cried out, God, if I can't die, and I want so badly to die, but if I can't, then you're going to have to be the one to show me how to live, because I don't know how to do this thing called quadriplegia. It was my first plea for help. And those were the days when my sister would come into the bedroom and she pushed back the drapes, let in the sunlight, and she'd get me up in my wheelchair after a long get-up routine, and she would wheel me to our living room and sit me in front of a black music stand, much like this one, and on it she would plop my Bible and then put a mouth stick in between my teeth so I could turn pages. My hands don't work. And I would flip the pages of the Bible this way and that, furiously looking for answers, trying to make sense of it all. Of course, I was still interested in what the Bible had to say about healing. And I found out in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. You can read it for yourself later, and you'll see that there Jesus is performing all kinds of wonderful miracles, all kinds of healings throughout the day and long past sunset. Next morning, the crowds return, and Simon and his companions go looking for Jesus. He's nowhere to be found. Finally, they discover him up on the hill. He had gone off to a solitary place to pray. And when they find him, they tell him all about this crowd of people at the bottom of the hill, the disabled, the diseased, the sick, the lame, the blind, all looking to be healed. But Jesus responds to them in the 38th verse. Listen to what he says. Let's go somewhere else. Let's go to the nearby villages where I can preach there also, for this is why I have come. And that's when it hit me. It, it, it wasn't that Jesus did not care about all those people at the bottom of the hill, disabled and diseased. No, it's just that their physical problems weren't his main focus. The gospel was his focus. The gospel says that sin kills, hell is real, but God is merciful, his kingdom can change you, and Jesus is your passport. And whenever people miss this, 
Whenever people miss this, whenever people only came to Jesus just to get their physical problems fixed, that's when the Savior would back away. Oh my goodness, no wonder I had been so depressed. I was mainly into Jesus just to get my problems fixed, just to get my issues solved. Yes, Jesus cares about my suffering. And he spent most of his time when he walked on earth relieving suffering. But the Gospel of Mark showed me the priorities of Jesus. Because the same man who healed blind eyes and healed withered hands is the same one who said, if that eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If that hand leads you astray, cut it off. Finally, I got the picture. To me, physical healing had always been the big deal. That's what it's all about. That'll really show God's power. But to the Lord, my soul was a much bigger deal. A much bigger deal. And that's when I started searching. I started searching the scriptures for a, a different kind of healing, a deeper kind of healing. A Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. And I tell you what, for the last 50 years in this wheelchair, that's been my prayer. And God has been answering. He's been squeezing the lemon, so to speak, exposing the sin and the selfishness and things in my heart that are in such desperate need of change. I'm far from being completed. I've got a long way to go until my sanctification results in my glorification when I actually do jump up out of this wheelchair and dance, kick, and do aerobics. God is always searching. He's always testing. And my weakness, my physical weakness, my physical problems are the very thing that King uses to expose what needs to be changed in my life. When we are weak, our defenses are down. The cracks in our character show. My weaknesses reveals the not so pretty stuff of which I am made. Suffering is the textbook that will teach you who you really are. And weakness reveals that we are all not the paragons of virtue that we would like to think we are. <laughs> Sadly, most Christians, I don't think we really appreciate the sanctifying effect, the cleansing effect of a weakness. We try to ignore weaknesses, those lemons in life that God squeezes hard. We are embarrassed by them. We don't want to talk about them. We try to hide them. We don't like suffering. We try to drug it, medicate it, surgically exorcise it, divorce it, institutionalize it, do anything but live with it. <laughs> but Andrew Murray, listen to what he said, a pastor from centuries past. He explains the value of weakness so well. He says, the Christian often tries to forget his weakness. God wants us to remember it and feel it deeply. The Christian wants to conquer his weakness and be set loose from it, but God wants us to rest and even rejoice in it. The Christian mourns over his weakness, but Christ teaches his servant to say, I take pleasure in my infirmities. I boast in my weakness. I delight in the limitations. The Christian thinks that his weakness is his greatest hindrance to life and service of God, but God tells us that it is the secret of strength and success. It is our weakness, heartily accepted and continually realized, that gives us our claim and access to the strength of him who said, my power is made perfect in your weakness. And God's not finished with me yet. Like when I got stage three breast cancer. The harder God squeezed me, that is the weaker I was, the more I learned to lean on Jesus. And the more I leaned on Jesus, the stronger I discovered him to be. I remember one day driving home from chemotherapy down the 101 freeway. My husband, Ken, was in the front seat and I was in my wheelchair in the back of the van. 
tied down. And we were having this conversation through the rearview mirror. And we started talking about how suffering is like little splashovers of hell. Kind of like waking you up, whoa. Waking you up out of your spiritual slumber and getting you seriously appreciating the actual hell from which Christ has rescued us. So there's little splashovers of hell. That's what suffering is. They wake us up. They get us asking hard questions. So then as we drove, we started wondering, well then what are splashovers of heaven? Are splashovers of heaven those days when all the bills are paid and there are no aches and pains and the sun is bright on the horizon, the sky is blue and the birds are singing and everybody's smiling and happy and and we pulled up into the driveway, turned off the ignition, and I said, no, no, I don't, I don't think those things are splashovers of heaven. I think a splashover of heaven is finding Jesus in your splashover of hell. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is ecstasy beyond compare. And when you're suffering, there's no one better to go to than the one who was hung like meat on a hook. He knows suffering. He wrote the book on suffering. And when you draw to him in the midst of that inner sanctum of fellowshipping with him and sharing in his sufferings, oh, the sweetness, oh, the ecstasy, oh, the joy, the tenderness, the loveliness, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is ecstasy beyond compare. Ecstasy beyond compare. And it is worth anything, anything to be his friend. It's like St. Ignatius said, all the pleasures of the world are nothing compared with the sweetness found in the gall and vinegar offered to Jesus Christ. We just need to remember that although Jesus died to save us from suffering in hell, he did not die to save us from suffering on earth. Martin Lloyd-Jones was once asked, what does a person look like who has truly met God? And alluding to Genesis 32, and Jacob, wrestling with the angel, he answered, he walks with a limp. The people who are closest to God, symbolically, metaphorically, walk with a limp. Don't despise your weakness. Boast in it. For then God's power rests on you, as does God's blessing as he uses your brokenness. So I thank God for the lemon of my quadriplegia. I thank God for the cancer that I went through. I thank God for the daily chronic pain that I deal with. It presses me and at times it pushes me and shoves me up against the breast of Jesus where otherwise I might not be naturally inclined to go. But suffering is like a sheepdog snapping at your heels, chasing you down the bloodstained road to Calvary where otherwise you would not go. I experience it every morning. Please don't think that 50 years in a wheelchair has made me an expert. Uh-uh, you got the lady up here who's not the veteran. I'm not the professional at being disabled. I will tell you truthfully how I get up in the morning, what it's like to wake up, especially now that I'm getting older. I'm older than Pastor Carter. <laughs> My goodness. Gee whiz. I have four years on him. And I tell you, with encroaching age, the aches and pains, plus the quadriplegia, this is normally what it's like on any given morning. I'm lying there with my head on the pillow, eyes closed, and I'm awake, but my eyes are closed. Isn't it funny how the whole course of your day can be decided right then in that instant when your eyes are still closed and you're still you know, awake, but your head's on the pillow? Well, I can hear my girlfriends running water in the in the kitchen for coffee. And I know they're gonna come into my bedroom, Ken's off doing errands. I know they're gonna come into my bedroom in a, in a few minutes with a hot cup of coffee and a cheery happy hello. And I'm lying there with my eyes closed thinking, oh God, I am so tired. I am so weary, I have no strength. I hurt so badly. I do not know how I'm gonna find the resources to get to lunchtime. I'm just so burdened, Jesus, I cannot do. One more day of quadriplegia, I have no energy for this, I really don't. 
I can't do quadriplegia, but I can do all things through you as you strengthen me. Living, living with quadriplegia and chronic pain. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Also, my lungs are bad. Ken, come on up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be my own best audiovisual aid of my message. Uh, uh, thank you. There we go. Give that man a hand. See, I'm not fooling. You got the real symbol of weakness up here. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't do quadriplegia, but I can't do all things through you as you strengthen me. Quadriplegia is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Yes. And so I say, Jesus, I have no smile for these girlfriends of mine who are going to come in here and give me a bed bath and do my toileting routines and get me dressed and sit me up in my wheelchair and brush my hair and brush my teeth and blow my nose. Lord Jesus, I have no smile for them, but you do. So please, may I borrow your smile? I have none this morning. I need yours desperately. Oh my goodness, and by 7.35 in the morning, I've got joy. Hard thought for and sent straight from heaven. Absolutely. You know, you gotta fight to stay satisfied in God. But it's a good fight. And the way I just described waking up in the morning, needing Jesus desperately, that is the Christian way to wake up in the morning. That is the best way. That's the biblical way to wake up in the morning. And I think maybe the real handicapped people are, you know who they are? They're the ones who, when their alarm clock goes off, they throw back the covers, jump out of bed, scarf down breakfast, take a quick shower, and then rush out the door, maybe having given God a speedy tip of the hat of a quiet time for like five or 10 minutes, but then they're off out the door on automatic cruise control. Did you know that James chapter four, verse six says, God opposes people like that? He resists the proud. He's against the proud. Who are the proud? Well, obviously, the proud are people who do not yield, do not submit to God at all, do not claim Christ as Savior. But the proud are also a lot of Christians. People who think, you know, I got saved 15, 25 years ago. I've been to enough Bible studies. I go to prayer meeting. I, I, I've got this Christian thing pretty much figured out. I know the lay of the land. So, Jesus, I'm going to go out my front door. And if I run into any problems, I'll check in with you. But I can pretty much take it from here. If that's the way you live, God resists you. But, it says, James chapter 4, verse 6, he may resist the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And who are the humble? Simply people like you and me who know that we can't do life without Jesus. We need Jesus. We just need Jesus. The humble ones are the ones who recognize their weaknesses. They are, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, having nothing, and yet possessing everything, being poor, but yet making many, many rich. And now I don't sing because I have to. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And it's why I am so looking forward to heaven. I am so looking forward to heaven. There will be praise songs for all of eternity. All that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. When by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory, be glory for me. And there will be songs for eternity. And so I'm not going to waste my sufferings down here on earth. Of all the things that are to waste in life, don't waste your weakness. Don't waste your suffering. Boast in it, delight in it, glory in it, because that's the sheepdog driving you to Jesus.
where the, you can say, I can do even this. I can do my life through Christ who strengthens me. If God permits the lemons in my life, then I'm going to partner, and I want you to partner with me and his Holy Spirit in making it lemonade, right? <laughs> and the recipe for that lemonade is in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. I think of this every day. Do everything without complaining. That's what it says right there. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do everything without complaining. Oh, friends, I want to put all complaining, all grumbling, all selfishness. I want to put it behind me. And I want God to, to make me a different Johnny than I was yesterday. I want to get actively engaged with this Holy Spirit today so that I can be a different Johnny, a better Johnny, a new Johnny, a fresh Johnny. I want to step into that design that God created me to be long before eternity. It's what it means to get actively engaged in your own sanctification because heaven is coming and I will have a new heart, not just a new body. Please don't be thinking that's the main focus. Like I said, I'm into the deeper healing and I'm looking for the new heart, a glorified heart that no longer twists the truth, a heart that doesn't complain or feel trapped by any circumstances, a heart that no longer resists God and looks for a, an escape or gets defeated easily by doubt or worry or anxiety, a heart that doesn't try to justify itself by feeling sorry for itself, that will be heaven for me. Oh my goodness, that will be heaven for me. On that day, God is going to close the curtain on sin and suffering and Satan and something so grand and glorious in his denouement, the appearance of the Lord Jesus is going to be so amazing that it will suffice for every one of your hurts and mine. It will atone for every single one of your tears. And then God is going to lift the veil, the curtain on our five senses, and we will see the whole universe in plain sight. And I can't wait for that day when I can, hopefully, hopefully, I don't know, maybe I can take this wheelchair with me to heaven <laughs> and I'll put it over there, right over there, this big old clunky thing with its grinding gears. I'm going to put it right over there and I, with my brand new glorified body and heart, I'm going to stand next to Jesus. Oh my goodness. And I will take his hand in mine. I can't feel in this hand. I haven't felt anyone touch this hand in 50 years, but I will feel his hand in mine. I will feel those nail scars where he bled for me. And I will say, Jesus, you were right when you said that in this world we would have trouble. Because that thing was a lot of trouble. <laughs> but Jesus... The weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. Jesus, thank you. And you know what? I know he will know I mean it. Because I know he will recognize me as the one who came to him every single morning, hemorrhaging human strength and needing his divine strength to smile, not in spite of the disability, but because of the disability because it's my sheepdog that drives me to him. So I, I used to say, and now Jesus, if you want to, you can send that thing to hell. <laughs> but you know what? You know what? I don't say that anymore. Because that wheelchair is my dark friend. It's dark, but it's still a friend. It's my hard schoolmaster. It's hard, but it's taught me many things. It is an unwelcomed guest, unwelcomed, but a guest nonetheless. Some time ago, in closing, my husband Ken and I had a chance to visit the Holy Land, and it was a wonderful time. Oh, we visited the Red Sea, and we went to the town of Bethlehem, and we designed a whole day to spend in the old city of Jerusalem. I was in my manual push chair and Ken bumpity bump bumped me down the Via Della Rosa. In a wheelchair, you don't go up the Via Della Rosa, you go down it. And we passed the Arab Bazaar with the wonderful music and the, and the smells and the spices. And we traveled further down that cobblestone path. And there was the Temple Mount on the right side. 
And then we made a left hand turn down a path and there was St. Anne's Church on the right. I snuck in there to sing a few hymns. Went a little bit further and then, oh my goodness, Ken Tata. Ken, look at this. It's the Pool of Bethesda. Oh, sweetheart, you would not believe how many times I used to imagine myself when I was in the hospital. I used to see myself right here, right, right here. The place was empty. All the Benny Hinn tour buses were down at the Red Sea. <laughs> there was nobody around at all. We had the place to ourselves. It was empty. And there was this soft breeze blowing and the air was dry and warm, but not too warm. And Tears started flowing down my eyes. Because Ken went, he, he jumped over the guardrail of the ruins to run down into the cistern to see if there really was still water in the pool of Bethesda. But in the meantime, I'm leaning against the guardrail, crying my eyes out. Because this is the place that I used to imagine myself physically healed. And God brought me all the way there by myself with this beautiful ruin in front of me to say to him, Jesus, thank you for saying no to my request for a physical healing because your interest in my deeper healing has been so much more satisfying, so much more delightful. Oh my goodness. Jesus, Jesus, had you healed me? I know I'd be on my third divorce, and I know I'd be, uh, I'd be planning some ski vacation to Mammoth Mountain or Vail, Colorado, but I know I wouldn't be here praising you and thanking you and blessing you and loving you and adoring you. Jesus, thank you, because a no answer to physical healing has purged sin from my life. It has increased compassion for others who hurt, especially those with disabilities. It's put complaining behind me. It has stretched my hope for heaven. It has pushed me to give thanks in times of sorrow. A no answer to my request for physical healing has increased my faith and made me love Jesus so much more. And most of all, a no, request to my, a no answer to my request for healing has meant that thousands of people with disabilities through Johnny and friends have had the chance to hear this gospel, this gospel that I've come to so love and, and find so precious in my life, we, we distribute wheelchairs all around the world to needy disabled people we do at Johnny and Friends. And we hold retreats just like you saw in the video. Retreats for families affected by disability. 50, 27 here in the States and 23 in developing nations. Always giving the hope and the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, I don't know, maybe, maybe today you see yourself at the Pool of Bethesda. Maybe you came here this morning hoping for your problems to get fixed, hoping that your situation would change, hoping that somehow you could escape your life circumstances. And maybe you're wondering why God has not fixed things, removed the disappointment, or given the healing that you've prayed for. Well, I tell you what, God may well remove the suffering from you, and if he does, hallelujah. It'll show his power, kind of like a, a dynamite power, an explosive power. But if he doesn't heal you, the power that you will experience will be like dynamo power, strong, steady, always continuing, faithful, constant. He may not remove your suffering, but I tell you what, he'll remove anything and everything that stands in the way between you and him when it comes to the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings and experiencing the sanctifying work of his Holy Spirit in your life. So do as William Law told the church centuries ago, receive every inward and outward trouble, every disappointment, every darkness and desolation with both your hands as a blessed occasion of dying to yourself and entering into a fuller fellowship with your Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at no inward or outward trouble in any other view. Reject every other thought about it. And then, every kind of trial and distress will become the blessed day of your prosperity. That is the deeper healing, friends. 
And guess what? You don't have to break your neck to experience it. God bless you. And thank you for listening. I want to take a moment to give an altar call this morning for people that God has so deeply spoken to you in the midst of your struggle. And you just want to come, as, as Johnny has talked about, and give thanks. Say, Lord, if, if you set me free, if you don't, if you change my situation, if you leave me where I am, I'm going to learn to be thankful. I'm going to learn to blossom. Even if I'm planted in a desert, I'm going to learn to bloom there by the grace of Almighty God. If that's you, slip out of your seat, please, in the balcony over in the annex here in the main sanctuary. Just come forward now. Just slip out now. Just come out now. And Johnny's going to come back and pray for you. God is the one. Christ is the one who gives beauty for ashes. If you're living with sorrow, if you've had something happen in your life and it's just, it's eating up your thought of your own future. It's destroying your present. And you need to be healed. It's just, there's a sorrow, there's a, there's a, a wounding that's much deeper sometimes than a physical wounding. And you just want God to touch your life. Just join those that are coming from everywhere. And let's believe God for what he alone is able to do. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Jesus, Jesus, thank you for not passing us by this morning. You took it upon yourself to visit us in all your power and glory. You came and you felt welcomed among the songs of praise and thanksgiving. And now you are knocking on our hearts, the hearts of Christians gathered here up front. Christians who have perhaps complained about their life circumstances. Christians who have kicked against the traces and wanted so much for you to fix things, wondering why you're not answering prayer. Well, you are answering, and you have answered today. And it's a deeper healing we Christians want. All of us, your brothers and sisters, your children, Lord Jesus, we want the deeper healing. So tomorrow morning when we wake up, Lord Jesus, help us to hold fast to Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, and go through the day without complaining because our souls have been rescued from hell and we're heading for heaven and glory hallelujah let us shine your light to a dark cynical skeptical world a world that is hungry for looking looking for true examples of what it means to follow jesus let us be that example may we please be your best ambassadors tomorrow and for those who do not know jesus who have come forward. Those who were dragged here this morning, perhaps by a friend, and you came to hear what this was all about, this gospel. Well, you heard the truth this morning. Sin kills. Hell is real. But God is merciful. And his kingdom can change you. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So would you open your heart you who have come forward to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, open your heart and invite Jesus to sit on the throne of your heart, to be your Lord. Confess your sin, your old way of doing things, the old habits, the bad patterns of living. Would you bundle them all up and put them at the foot of the cross? And then seek forgiveness and let Jesus acknowledge to you that he has pardoned you as you put your faith and trust and confidence in him. You will have escaped hell, hallelujah, and you will be heading home to heaven with the rest of us. And oh, what a party that'll be. Lord Jesus, we cannot wait. So those of us who are longtime believers, followers of you, and those of us who right now for the first time have invited you to be our Lord and Savior, 
Would you please help us to go out from here and issue party invitations to everybody we know? We want more people, our friends and our family. We want our coworkers. We want our neighbors to know the glory and the grace and the beauty of your gospel. And we want them to be at the party, the wedding supper of the Lamb, when the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the tongues of those who cannot speak will shout for joy, and the lame shall leap like deer. And we shall enter Zion with singing, and everlasting joy will crown our heads, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. We long and look forward to that day. Keep us faithful, Lord Jesus, until that time. In your glorious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.